What's happening, y'all? Welcome inside the Fantasy Stock Exchange. Bush coming at you solo to talk about who are the league-winning running backs in fantasy football this year. In 2021 fantasy football, who is going to win people leagues and how can you spot them before they are drafted? What this is is basically an early round running back strategy video where we determine who has the ceiling, who doesn't, who's too risky, who's more of a safer pick. We hear the term ceiling thrown around all the time as a buzzword, but who actually has it is what we're going to investigate here. The most important thing that you can garner from this video is that you need to weigh all factors, not just volume, not just talent, not just situation. The more boxes a player can check, the higher the ceiling, the higher the floor, and the higher the chances of you winning a fantasy championship with that player. So with that being said, we are on the road to 5,000 subscribers, guys. If you haven't already done so, please go down, hit the subscribe button, totally free to do so. Like the video while you're down there and leave any of your comments down below. We're going to hit the intro and then we're going to get right into this. Okay, so as I mentioned, those questions that I talked about, who has the ceiling, who's too risky, what kind of upside does everybody have? We're going to answer those questions right now. And what we're going to start with was the first question. What does it take for a league-winning running back, those true difference-making dudes that help you win a fantasy championship? What does it take from a volume perspective, a situational perspective, to get to that level? And I went back from 2020 to 2013, and I wanted to know, who averaged 20 plus half PPR points per game with a minimum of 12 games played. So anytime you're averaging 20 plus PPR points or half PPR points, that is, that's elite level production from the running back position in fantasy, right? So who are these guys? And there was about 16 of them and you can see them on the screen right now. This past year, we had guys like Alvin Kamara. We had Dalvin cook. We had Derek Henry going all the way back to Le'Veon Bell and Jamal Charles in 2014, 2013. These were the dudes that were the absolute difference makers and really quick on these tables. So I'm not confusing anybody, any, anything that's in green right now on the table indicates that they were above average among these 16 running backs these elite options in that category and yellow was about average red about below average. So remember we're using a sample of elite options. So anybody who's got a red label on them doesn't mean that they're bad necessarily in that season. It just means that they were below average of these elite options. And the names on this list, as I mentioned, these were true difference making RB ones that carried your fantasy team. When we look at this year with Dalvin cook and Alvin Kamara and Derek Henry, these were some of the highest owned players on championship rosters. Then we see CMC a couple of years ago. There was a couple guys, 18. Uh, we had Todd Gurley, Saquon Barkley, a number of other dudes. And as I mentioned, all the way back to DeMarco Murray and Jamal Charles a couple of years ago. So this is what we're looking for, right? When you're drafting a running back in the first round and the second round, we want one of these dudes. These guys strike the fear of God into your fantasy opponents in those seasons. When you got, you know, Alvin Kamara going on Monday night football the next day, you're like, damn, I, I need to be up by 25 points because this guy is capable of producing that type of output in a single game. So when you look at all these numbers, I mentioned averages. These were the average number of volume based factors that all of these guys had in common, right? You got carries about 18 per game targets about six per game receptions, about four per game, 22, 23 touches per game and over a touchdown per game. And then uh, from a more practical sense, if you think about it over the course of a full season, all of those numbers equivalent to about 365 touches, 96 targets, 74 receptions, and about 18 touchdowns. And I know we're working with a 17 game season now, but to make it more easy to understand 16 games is, is relatively a lot easier to understand. So on average, to be one of those 20 plus half PPR elite backs per game, you basically needed that amount of work. And that is the volume factor, right? I mentioned you can love the volume of a player, but he also needs to have those situational factors to help him propel uh, some of these dudes to elite RB status. Because you could have seen on that table, those guys didn't meet every threshold. It was just a certain number of thresholds. Sometimes they had low receiving work, so they made up for it with a lot of carries. Sometimes they had uh, low carry volume, but they made up for it with a lot of receptions or touchdowns or something of that nature. So we love volume in fantasy, but it isn't everything. Guys like Todd Gurley last year, Le'Veon Bell, Melvin Gordon, David Johnson, all these guys have been examples in recent years that you can love the volume, but the situational factors and the efficiency and the talent need to be there to go along with that volume to get that elite level production. And when we look at the situational factors for the same list of guys, right? We have 
some uh, factors are team specific, right? How good is your offense? How good is your quarterback? How good is your offensive line? And how many games is your team going to win? And it always, 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 always helps you sleep at night when your running back that you chose early in drafts is attached to a good situation with a good offense, a good quarterback, a good play caller, a good offensive line. The more boxes a player can check, the easier it is for him to reach that elite level and the less he'll have to do on his own. And what I mean by this is, a player could be, you know, not getting a lot of volume, a bad situation for them to be an elite level player. They have to be just that they need to be super, super efficient. And that is really hard to predict. And the only recent example that we can think of that has been super efficient on, you know, a low volume of, of attempts and has been at that elite level is Alvin Kamara. You can see that in 2018, he only received 18.3 touches per game, which is about five touches per game lower than average. And he needed to average 6.1 yards per carry and 7.7 .7 yards per touch to make up for it in that season. So what we can gather from this is that all these things are related. A player can have talent for sure, but if he's going to not get any volume in a terrible offense, we can't expect a huge ceiling. Now that we have this information, we've looked over the past uh, data. What can we do to apply this to the current running backs today, right? The current crop of running backs, uh, I'm going to look at the top 20, for example, right? Because we want to look at the guys that are going in the early rounds because these are the guys that we're spending that high draft capital on. I'm sure there's some later round guys like a Kareem Hunt, for example, who if Nick Chubb went down, he might have this elite level ceiling, but we're only going to look at guys that are basically consensus top three round picks. And again, if somebody has a red spot in one area, it doesn't mean that they're a terrible fantasy pick and I hate them. It just means that they're deficient in a certain area and they will need to make it up somewhere else. Not even Christian McCaffrey hit every measure, right? Not even Christian McCaffrey is going to hit the volume, the offensive line, the, the quarterback play, everything. Not everybody is going to hit every area and that's okay. What we're looking for is how many boxes does each guy check? Another thing to keep in mind is that I looked in depth at these players, right? I didn't just go, oh, I think Saquon Barkley has the carry volume. Yeah, that's that's a yes for him. No, I looked at their careers, their history, um, the coaching staff, trends, splits, and everything to determine these ratings. I didn't just randomly decide, for example, that Ezekiel Elliott cannot receive six targets per game. I listed that as a no because Ezekiel Elliott has never done that in his career, nor is he likely to do it now that all of his receiving weapons in this offense are the best they've ever been in Ezekiel Elliott's career. So if you disagree with one of these ratings I, I gave, then I'd be more than happy to explain my rationale in the comments. I'll just do my best to explain the for sure no answers um, on screen so that you can kind of see where I, my head was at when I was doing this. So as you can see on the screen, we have the top 20 running backs according to underdog ADP. So currently these are the best example of the, the elite level guys or the guys that we think can be in that elite level territory. And any question marks that you see on the screen, anything in orange is a question mark. Anything that is a question mark is something that I did my best to give the benefit of the doubt to, right? If it wasn't a, def a definitive yes or no, they won't receive this target volume. They won't receive this touchdown volume. I gave it a question mark just to leave some room because we are measuring player ceilings, right? And they could be in an outlier season where they get a super amount of, you know, receiving volume or touchdown. So anything with a question mark is something that I deem to be potentially something that they could do, but it's not as likely as a firm yes would be obviously. And again, with the volume factors, you can see that if they were deficient in one area, then they would probably have to make it up somewhere else. And you can see, for example, with the top three running backs, Dalvin Cook and Derrick Henry are deficient in the receiving category, right? Dalvin Cook gets some receiving work, but he doesn't get six targets per game. Derrick Henry barely gets any receiving work. And you can see that they had to make that up with the amount of carries they got. They got more than above average number of carries, more than that 18 carries per game. They get like 20, 22 carries a game. And that's where they can make that up. Whereas you can see with Alvin Kamara, he doesn't get that many carries. So he can't, um, be in that elite level because he doesn't get enough targets to supplement that. If you got Christian McCaffrey level targets, then we'd be able to say that. But with Taysom Hill and Jameis Winston, we're not going to know how many targets uh, Alvin Kamara can get and so on and so forth. You can see with Jonathan Taylor, Ezekiel Elliott, Cam Akers, uh, Nick Chubb, these guys aren't going to get elite level receiving work, which is what six targets a game is, by the way. And then guys like Austin Eckler, Aaron Jones, DeAndre Swift, uh, and a couple other dudes, they don't get the elite level carry numbers that we're looking for from a three down work order. Just because they're deficient in one area doesn't mean that they're bad. It just means that they need to make it up somewhere else. And then the further you get in this ADP, as you can see with some of the later guys, JK Dobbins, Chris Carson and stuff, the less likely it's going to be that they're going to be able to achieve the ceiling. And that makes sense, right? Because they're lower in ADP. We're trying to measure how good they're going to be with our average draft position. And the fact that they are lower means they should be less likely to achieve that elite level ceiling. And again, 
Those are estimates on my part. The green is above average. Yellow is about average. Orange is a question mark that could go either way. And red is a definitive no, at least in my opinion, with some reasoning. So let's go on to the efficiency and situational factors for some of these guys. Now we can see on the screen right now, the averages are on the left side, offensive rank and points per game, their PFF run blocking grade, age, team wins, efficiency, yards per carry and yards per touch. And I also threw in some injury concerns if we know of any right now, just because that does play a factor, right? If you're determining someone's risk level and for example, they're Saquon Barkley and they're coming off of a torn ACL, it's a concern that you need to have when you're deciding to pick them. So as you can see for Christian McCaffrey, especially he's the 101 and he still is the 101 for me, but his team specific factors are not that good. When you look at him, he has Offensive uh, rank and points per game, I'd be very shocked if the Carolina Panthers are a top eight offense. I'd be very shocked if they're a top 12 offensive line for run blocking. I'd be very shocked if they won more than 10 games, but Christian McCaffrey makes it up in so many other ways that it's okay. Now, when you're looking at these situational factors, I would you know, hone your eyes to the green, right? The guys who have the most green in their situations are Derrick Henry, Cam Akers, Clyde edwards Hilaire, J.K. Dobbins, Nick Chubb, Alvin Kamara, Jonathan Taylor, and Ezekiel Elliott. And that makes sense, right? Those guys are all in great offenses. They're all in situations that have good offensive lines. They should be scoring a lot of points. And that can help propel them to overcome some of their volume concerns, right? Because with Cam Akers and Ezekiel Elliott and Jonathan Taylor, we don't know how much receiving work they're going to get. Same with Derrick Henry. And then with Nick Chubb, we don't know how much uh, Kareem Hunt's going to eat into his workload. But the fact of how good of an offense, how good of a rushing offense, how good of an offensive line he has can help propel him to that elite level. So... As I mentioned, when you compare the volume side and the situational side, you can see the relationship. One area can be made up for in another area. CMC, for example, like I said, has such elite volume and is so talented that he's able to overcome somewhat of a mediocre situation in Carolina. All that being said, here's how you interpret this from a practical sense so I don't confuse anyone. And if I've confused you already, I apologize. It's just hard to communicate this information in a practical sense. But here's how we could do it in a practical sense. You can weight the good against the bad to determine if a player checks a lot of boxes or if they're deficient in certain areas. So what I did to do this was I assigned a point value to all of these. Anything that was a green, meaning above average, I equated it to eight points. Anything that was yellow, which was about average, five points. And anything in orange was a question mark. I gave minus two points and anything in red was minus five points. So if you were great in a lot of areas, you had enough great to outweigh the bad essentially. And this is what came of it. And you can see on the screen, you're going to see all of these guys are either green, yellow, orange, or red. And as you can see there, anybody with a ceiling score of above 30 was labeled in green. And what green basically meant was that the good outweighed the bad significantly, and they have the high ceiling plus the low risk factor that we're looking for. And these guys, I guess, would be considered targets of mine going into drafts. And then anybody in yellow had a, a ceiling score above zero, but you know, lower than 25 or so. And these guys would also be considered good targets for me with a good ceiling and, you know, risk level that's, that's manageable. Anybody in orange is more so a guy that I'm a bit wary of who might have a great ceiling like Ezekiel Elliott does, or like Najee Harris does, but the question marks lead me to believe that it's a bit sketchy. And then anybody in red, I considered the ceiling is probably there, but I also don't want to take the risk to achieve that ceiling because I think the risk factors significantly outweigh the reward factors. And you can tell, obviously, with guys like Joe Mixon and DeAndre Swift, Chris Carson, Miles Sanders, you guys know that we're not the biggest fans of these guys. The one guy I will say is a little different is David Montgomery, just because this is a measure of ceiling and David Montgomery's ceiling isn't very high. So naturally he's going to rank lower in something like this. I do actually not mind David Montgomery at his value, but I do agree. He doesn't have the significant ceiling of some of these other running backs. And that's to be expected. He's RB 20 and ADP CMC, Derrick Henry, Jonathan Taylor, Cam Akers, Nick Chubb, and JK Dobbins were the guys that spit out that elite level ceiling in this format. For J.K. Dobbins specifically, he would need more of that Alvin Kamara level efficiency that we've seen from Alvin Kamara in the past, which is very hard to replicate. So I don't think this is a likely elite ceiling for J.K. Dobbins, but it is possible for him if he can keep up the efficiency levels that he had in his rookie season. Basically, the point of this entire exercise was to break down logically and create a framework to realistically evaluate a player's range of outcomes. If you look at DeAndre Swift, for example, you may hear somebody on another podcast or another channel randomly blurt out that he has a top five level ceiling. But when you look at his risk factors, how bad his offense is, 
his offensive line, the competition in his backfield, all of those factors contribute to the fact that he probably doesn't have that level of ceiling. And you can see that because he's going to be lacking in uh, targets. He's going to be lacking in carries. He's going to be lacking in scoring opportunities. I don't care how uh, talented a player is. You just can't achieve that level of ceiling if those factors are all completely uh, difficult to achieve. So again, we can go through each one of these guys individually real fast. Christian McCaffrey has that elite level ceiling. We've seen it. We've seen him achieve that elite level ceiling. Dalvin Cook also has that elite level ceiling, but he's being weighed down a little bit by some risk. Derrick Henry, of course, has that elite level ceiling. Saquon Barkley has that elite level ceiling, but he's being weighed down by some risk. Same goes for Alvin Kamara. Jonathan Taylor has that elite level ceiling. Ezekiel Elliott definitely has the elite level ceiling, but he's being weighed down by more risk than some of the other top backs are, given the fact that we've seen his play decline a little bit and we've seen his offense be a little bit more inefficient than, you know, Danny will give it credit for. Cam Akers, Nick Chubb, Austin Eckler, Aaron Jones. All these guys have elite level ceiling with varying levels of risk. Joe Mixon, in my opinion, risk outweighs the reward. I think he has a good level ceiling. I don't think he has an elite level ceiling, but that risk factor of how efficient is this guy going to be? How consistent is he going to be? How good is the offense going to be? And who is going to eat into some of his workload? To me, makes him on my do not draft list. You guys have known for a while that we're not the highest on Joe Mixon, and it's for a number of these factors. He has a good ceiling, but that risk outweighs the reward for me. Najee Harris is just a question mark all the way around. We don't know how much volume he's going to get. We assume it's going to be a lot. We don't know how good the offense is going to be. The offensive line doesn't look like it's going to be very good. So he's a guy that is a little bit more risky than some of these other dudes. Antonio Gibson, you can see in this third column, is the only guy with yellow um, because we we really like Antonio Gibson. We think he has a good ceiling, and we think the risk is worth the reward. CEH, again, much like Najee Harris and Ezekiel Elliott, there's a, there's a decent amount of question marks about them, but we understand where the ceiling is. DeAndre Swift, Chris Carson, Miles Sanders, David Montgomery – are all very risky. And David Montgomery is one that I'm I'm willing to take a bit more of a risk on just because I think his ceiling uh, is capped, which is why he's in red and not in orange. I think if we weren't measuring ceiling, we were just measuring his output, he'd be more so in orange than he would be in red. With J.K. Dobbins, like I said, he's going to need to achieve Alvin Kamara level efficiencies for him to actually hit that ceiling, which is probably unlikely. So maybe he should be a bit more yellow than I'm giving him credit for. But all that being said, I hope you guys enjoyed this. If you made it to this point in the video, comment down below, bell cow backs are the best. And I will be doing this for wide receivers and maybe the other positions as well if you guys enjoy them. If you have any suggestions on how I can make this a little bit more easy to understand, because I understand this was a lot of information, a lot of numbers, a lot of tables, a lot of colors. So if you have any suggestions on how I can make this easier, on, easier to understand, please leave them below. I'm more than happy to help uh, make this an easier uh, process for you guys. So... As I mentioned, if you guys enjoyed this, like, comment, subscribe, peace out, and enjoy your Monday. Why you need the money?